Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the first edition of, uh, of the SIP of Science webinar series. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna have fantastic speakers over the next coming months and most of them agreed upon. And uh, the first one is Professor Louis Forney from the UK. <clears throat> and we have a lot in common. Uh, I am more punctual than he is, but uh, anyway, uh, we both trained in the UK. I am up north in the, uh, in the Liverpool region and he down south in the posh fields of, uh, of the UK. So, uh, and he is an, an internationally highly acclaimed expert of CRRT. And we know each other for a long time. We performed several times on international conferences and we uh, published uh, several papers. And uh, in fact, two, is, uh, two, two papers are still in the pipeline. So uh, with this introduction, uh, I would like to ask Louis to start uh, his lecture. Share your screen, Louis, please. Mm. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, over to Louis Forney. The stage is yours, Louis. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, all I can do is apologize really for this um, enormous, as we would say in England, cock up for the IT. But I'll try my best to um, get over that bit. The problem is you might not be able to see my video, but that's, that's a different story. So I'm going to just run through... Um, timing and renal replacement therapy and hopefully answer some questions and just summarize the field or the state of the field as we are. So there's my conflicts of interest. Um, none of them are really um, applicable to this. I'd like to thank Zolt. He probably wishes he hadn't invited me now but, um, for inviting me. And I hope that um, that's Hungarian for thank you, which I think is Kotanov. So if it isn't, I apologize. Um, part of the thing about giving talks these days is you get feedback, right? You get feedback from um, your colleagues and some of it is quite good. You can't let us, let's see, see this, but um, some of it's not so flattering as it says, um, not useful, poor presentation look bored while speaking. So I don't know if you can see me, but hopefully I'm not looking too bored. So can you still see that result? Yeah. Okay. Right now, I'm going to show you a video. So Zolt was talking about our, um, the fact that we've worked together and we're good buddies. This is just to show you some of the things we occasionally get up to. So you probably won't believe who this is singing. This is um, Xavier Monet. I'll let you enjoy this. What slide do you see now, Zol? Is it like a chair? It's like a chair. This should yeah, come you, with a warning. Yeah, that's right. But you can't see the video, no? No, we can. Ah, right. <laughs> so this is the video that should come with a warning. So this is just to show that we're not just boring academics. <laughs> yeah, that was in Turkey. Mm. So this is a rather over-exuberant Turkish singer, and this chap you may recognise. So if you didn't... Um, recognize him. Here he is here. So that's a, a still of Zolt. So you can see a man of many talents. So you can still see the lecture, the slides, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On so, with the talk. Yeah, so I'll get on with the talk now. The problem is that because we're not in presentation mode, the um, some of the graphics have gone somewhat AWOL. So when should renal replacement therapy be initiated? Well, early, late, or in between, really. We can't really talk about that. But if you're thinking of starting renal replacement therapy, then the first question you have to ask is whether the patient needs acute kidney injury or not. So 
These, uh, this is from a review article we wrote on absolute and relative indications for commencing or not commencing um, renal replacement therapy. And the absolute ones are fairly standard, severe hyperkalemia, severe acidosis, organ dysfunction due to diuretic resistant fluid overload, which is probably the most common reason for starting renal replacement therapy now. Now, there are reasons not to start, and they include um, futility. I can't show you the rest of these because it's not um, presenting. And then there are other indications that are slightly softer. Um, and so, you know, that may just be, you know, oliguria or patients' um, mental state, perhaps in um, hepatic encephalopathy, where you may start for other reasons. And also, I mean, apart from futility, you might not um, start because you don't feel the patient actually needs it at that time. So when to start? Well, the set in stone, uh, if I move that, you'll see it. Set in stone um, indications for renal replacement therapy are the ones that you all know, right? Life-threatening hyperkalemia, refractory metabolic acidosis, life-threatening volume overload, and intoxications. But they're actually not that common. So then you have to ask yourself, why do we actually perform renal replacement therapy? And it's mainly um, for solute control, nitrogenous waste, organic acid control, as well as middle molecules, and mediators of inflammation. That's a different topic on its own. Or volume control. So solute or volume control, they're the reasons. But the question is, when do we do that? So early on in this story, in you know, over 15 or 15 years ago now, there were various studies that looked at early versus late initial initiation of renal replacement therapy. And this was a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at that um, question, as I said, from some time ago. And what it found, here's the date here, you can't see the rest, is that early institution of renal replacement therapy may have a beneficial impact on survival. Of course, these studies were completely um, hamstrung by issues such as how do you define early, how do you find late? And you know, there was some indication, as I said, that the early bird gets the worm, early treatment uh, was better, but of course, the worm did die. Now, the other thing at that time is that some people suggested that early initiation may be relatively harmful um, to the uh, patients. And, you know, one of the ways that um, can be harmful is by delaying um, recovery. And there are various mechanisms that have been proposed for that. Um, excessive ultrafiltration rate, it's one, so if the UFR, UFR is too high, it has, um, exceeds the rate of the intravascular, of filling of the intravascular compartment from the incision, and that contributes to something called hemodialysis-induced um, renal toxicity. And then there's osmotic fluid chips, lots of sodium through dialysis, for example, may lift, result in fluid chips, um, slowing down repair of the kidney, Composition in kidney, composition of dialysate has also been linked to hemodialysis-induced injury, as has the temperature of the dialysate. But perhaps the, the most important factor is that of myocardial stunning that we observe with certainly some forms of renal replacement therapy. And you know, we showed this some time ago now using um, intermittent hemodialysis for acute kidney injury that patients... Um, using global strain or speckle tracking techniques, we could show that once people were started on renal replacement therapy, their hearts didn't like it. Now, these are intermittent um, therapies done over relatively short periods of time, so not continuous therapies. And we're currently doing that study as I speak. So the challenge is when you consider the starting of renal replacement therapy is a decision can often be quite subjective and it's based on both the clinical information and your inherent bias. 
the wide variation in the severity of indications prompting the start of renal replacement therapy. So some people might think 6.4 is <coughs> sufficient hyperkalemia for RRT. Some may, make to, may wait 6.5 or 7. And many factors modify your decision, right? The age of the patient, comorbidities, responsiveness to a diuretic, things like that. So rather than start early or whatever, should we just wait and watch and see what happens to our patients? Well, let's examine the evidence, right? These are the landmark trials of renal replacement therapy in the critically ill. So this one's with Catherine Bauman, 20 years ago now, didn't show a difference in early versus late. Small single center study. And um Early was described as a cranial clearance of less than 20 mils per minute or AKI for 12 hours. Then there was a study from India, which used a much more aggressive um, definition of early and late. And then the three that you would have heard of, the Elaine trial, the Kiki trial, and ideal ICU, followed by another trial, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, if we look at the um, studies that have been done so far, the Elaine study. This was a single center study in Germany with 231 um, patients. And this was single center, Alex Arbox group in Munster. And as I said, 231 patients were um, randomized that to have a Kiki, um, sorry, um, a Kadigo stage two or three AKI. They also had to have a positive NGAL, which is a biomarker for renal injury. And over four-fifths of these patients were, had cardiac surgery. All of them got CBBHDF. And what the study showed was there was a mortality difference in patients who were studied, um, treated early. That was within eight hours of hitting these criteria, whereas the late group was greater than 12 hours and also had reached Cadigo 3. So not very long in terms of timing. And the later group had more renal replacement therapy and slower recovery. So that was really quite a dramatic single center study. So the strengths were, it was a, a mono uh, technique, all had CVHDF, re relative homogenous group, all post-operative, mainly cardiac. The weaknesses, as I said, single center, unblinded, a fragility index of three. So what does that mean? That means if three patients for one arm transferred to the other, you would have got a different result. Over three quarters of the patients had a degree of volume overload. And that is actually quite important because if they actually had true volume overload, then that's an indication for renal replacement therapy on its own. So even though they were treated early, because they had volume overload, it was effectively in some studies could be viewed as late. So then we came to the next study, which was a Kiki. This was a French study um, left by Stéphane Gaudry, which was published in New England. And this was multi-center, right? 31 intensive care units in France, uh, 620 patients with severe acute kidney injury. So they all had um, stage three. And um, so randomization after Cadigo stage three had been six hours was the early group, whereas late, they actually waited and over had severe laboratory abnormalities or volume overload they were started or if they were on it for more than three days. And here they showed quite a dramatic um, change from Elaine. The mortality was about the same, but the patients requiring renal th replacement therapy was much lower in the delayed group, so just 51%, whereas in the early group, nearly 100%. And similarly in the lane, nearly 100% of both groups got it. So very little difference in mortality, but a considerable reduction in um, resource allocation. So the strengths were multi-center, 50% were on intermittent, 85% of the patients were oppressors, so they were more critically ill than Alex's group, and over two-thirds had septic shock. They only really included advanced acute kidney injury, so some people may think that's ungeneralizable, and again, it was unblinded. 
Then there was the ideal study, again from France, looking at patients with sepsis, early versus delayed. I mean, again, there was no difference in mortality. Again, the delayed group showed a reduction in RRT. And in fact, this study was um, stopped early on the grounds of futility. So we had two um, contrasting results, really. So that left us at the time a little further on, right? Akiki showed us that fitting certain criteria, like if your urea was above 40 or a creatinine of X, something I never use, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean the patient needs renal replacement therapy. And if Elaine is true, then it probably needs to be reflected in the multi-center trial if that practice was to be adopted in a particularly homogenous group. So the answer we waited for, um, then we had the START AKI trial, which was to give us the answer. This was looking at early initiation, um, you know, did that decrease mortality against standard care, really? And this was slightly different protocol because they had a normal standard of care and then they had an accelerated strategy that was um, renal replacement therapy within 12 hours of meeting the um, eligibility criteria, which was stage two or three AKI, in patients where it wasn't deemed necessary at that time. So in patients where they weren't sure what to do, they waited. So they had equipoise as to whether they could start renal replacement or not. And what they found was that there was, again, a little difference in mortality, but renal replacement dependence um, was significantly decreased um, in the accelerated or the early group. And complications and adverse events were also um, increased in the um, accelerated strategy. So early was associated with more need for renal replacement therapy long term and an increased um, adverse events, mainly infection and mainly due to catheter insertion. And if you looked at mortality, you could see there was no difference. And the various groups, when they looked to a heterogeneity of treatment effect, there really wasn't much difference that they'd seen. Of course, some of you may be aware that this study has now been picked apart and we've looked at um, geographical differences and differences in other groups and subgroup analysis has yielded some interesting data, but most of which has been underpowered for. When this study hit the press, it was quite interesting. This is our National Institute for Health and Care Research. They said that it showed that early dialysis does not improve survival among critically ill patients. And a large trial found that starting dialysis within 12 hours of AKI was no more effective than watchful waiting. As with most things in science and in medicine, the devil's in the detail, right? And so, you know, if you look at the supplementary files and you look at the consult diagrams, then you may find a bit more um, information. This is the screening log from STAR AKI, and you can see that nearly 24,000 patients met the inclusion criteria. Over eight, nearly 9,000 were excluded. And in fact, in the end, only 3,000 patients were included in the fully eligible group. So the problem we have, of course, is that this 3,000 is the one the study was on, and it's a huge study. You have to congratulate uh, Sean and Ron who did it. But we have to treat all the 24,000. So that's quite, quite a challenge, because can we apply these results to that? And the authors actually make some interesting comments about our own study. This is Sean Bagshaw, who um, some of you may know. And he said that within their study, there's probably a Goldilocks phenomenon here. Those who are um, familiar with that story. So premature and accelerated dialysis in some patients may bring more hazard than benefits. But at the same time, if you wait too long, the, the risk may be greater. And Ron Wald is co-author said that there's a danger of our findings may be misinterpreted because we don't know how late is too late and that needs to be fully explored. So you can see that they're leaning towards a personalised approach really within this window. 
And in fact, the French did give us the answer. They gave us the advance answer with Akiki too, where they effectively took the late group from Akiki and split that into late and really late. So the late group, they waited or they waited until um, a more delayed strategy. So the urea was above 50, they were volume overloaded. And this is what they found. They found the mortality in the very late group so a more delayed um, strategy where you waited for an absolute mandatory indication, which was highlighted in their uh, protocol, or urea of above 50 was associated with potential harm. Right? More delayed, of course, there was less RRT, but in fact, more patients died. So you can be too late. So it may be in some, but early some and others it's too late. So um, what do I do? Well, this is probably um, the best way to sum it up. It's from um, intensive care medicine, um, a review. So if your patient has a life-threatening complication of AKI that can be modified by RRT, then you should give it to them, as long as it's consistent with goals of care. So if futility is, uh, if the patient really shouldn't be treated, then you're not going to start RRT. Then you can wait. Optimize hemodynamics and fluid optimization, so the stuff we do on IQ every day, avoid nephrotoxins and adjust um, drug doses and give nutrition as needed. And then you can monitor the patient and organ dysfunction and AGI, AKI trajectories. You may use additional tools, through my stress test, for example, to look at your tubular function, biomarkers to assess whether there's evidence of persistent um, tubular injury. So CCL14, for example, might have a role here. But if the patient develops life-threatening complications, could be modified by RRT, just like here, you would initiate renal replacement therapy. If they don't, well, if the patient develops persistent acute kidney injury with no signs of recovery, or progressive fluid overload, then I'd consider renal replacement therapy in that sort. But there may be some where you wait, don't develop life-threatening complications, and get better. And that's what the studies have told us. Now, you may, of course, conclude, well, this is all very well, but it's rubbish. And the reason it's rubbish is because the main determinant of when people receive renal replacement therapy are human factors. And this is what Reflect, we reflect what we do um, every day. So this should be a cartoon that actually works. But here you see the doctor saying, you know, can we start renal replacement therapy to which the nurse says, yes. And the answer is when? Well, it's five o'clock in the morning. I'm going to wait until the next shift. That's what probably determines your timing in real life, unless it's very emergent. The alternative is, can we start renal priority? Yes, but we need access, to which the doctor replies, well, it's 5 a.m., I'll wait until the day team are here before I put the access in. And I think you'll probably all sympathise with that approach. So that's timing. Now, this is actually an interesting piece of data. So if I just get rid of that. This is timing in the real world. Right? So this is a screening log from a study we're doing in the UK called Mosaic, which is looking at um, bicarbonate administration in acute kidney injury. And one of the endpoints is the need for renal replacement therapy. And patients are not included if they need urgent renal replacement therapy. So these are patients that weren't included in, in the study because they need urgent renal replacement therapy. Now, you can see there's a kind of hump between four hours. But then there's quite a few that linger on the more recent graph. And there's quite a few patients that for their urgent renal replacement therapy are waited more than 24 hours. So whatever the um, studies told us about timing, we actually don't listen to them. The paediatricians have listened to them in part. This is um, a survey of practice in the US, sorry, in the paediatric um, community, which have suggested that there's a wide variation in practice. That includes organisational aspects, education, training, also dose prescription, as well as coming off um, treatment. And um, they also point out that can we reach um, consensus about various things without 
adequate evidence. And they replaced what they looked at um, historically, data on initiation, and it seemed shorter in the modern era to that of 10 or 15 years ago, but was not significantly different. So one wonders if we've really learned anything. So what I would say, the take home message is just keep calm, watch, wait and watch your patient. And then um, when you decide they need renal replacement therapy, start in a timely fashion. So I apologize for the problems we've had in technology. I put it entirely down to Brexit as opposed to my um, uh, lack of skills. This is a society some of you may be interested in joining, the International Society of Critical Care Nephrology. That will be announced at Vicenza in June. Um, it's um, we'll have our own journal, which is already uh, available, blood purification. And the aim is to um, enhance the interaction of patients, of people we're caring for, aka patients, including nephrologists, intensivists, and anaesthetists. Okay. I'll get rid of that. So I'm sorry about that, but hopefully you got Thanks. something out of that. Thank you, Louis. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, it's it's a pity the technical issue, but but anyway, that's it. But uh, I think um, uh, we've learned very important messages here. I wonder if there are any questions from the audience. Now, those of you who are following us on uh, online, you can um, ask questions in, in the Q&A, right? So, Louis, may I just start? Because what I really found intriguing is the, the biomarker-based approach. And you, do you use, you mentioned in your flowchart that you published in Intensive Care Medicine, yeah. that in your algorithm, that, that additional tools like the fruzamide, um, uh, stress, test stress test and yeah. biomarkers. So do you use any of those in your practice and when? Yeah, so the, the fruit of my stress test is particularly interesting, I think, because we, we've probably all been doing that in one way or another um, over the years. And that's the thing we probably, we use the most. So we would challenge patients to a milligram a kilo of fruit of mine. So in one milligram per kilo. Per kilo, yeah. So, you know, and in those that are direct, that's in diuretic naive patients, patients who have already been on diuretics you know, long term, they would give one and a half milligrams per kilo and then look at the urine output over the next two hours. And certainly, you know, if it's less than 200 mils, then the chances of them going on to dialysis, you know, is in excess of 80%. So that would put us in a group that we're more moved to do it. The biomarkers we really only use um, in the research arena. So in the studies we're doing, Big Pack 2 and whatever, we use them there. I'm hoping to introduce those, but it's, it's difficult because if you use biomarkers to guide RRT, there's not a lot of evidence out there. So I mean, myself and Alex have also published using a biomarker with the FST. So we published on CCM where we looked at CCL14, which is a marker of prolonged um, acute kidney injury or persistent acute kidney injury. And a positive CCL14 plus a positive fruit of my stress test would give you, it gives you an ROC of over 0.9. So that combination probably will predict, you know, in a high certainty who's going to need RRT. So the younger fellows in the audience might then say, well, actually, that gives me the best possible way of working out who will need RRT. Because if I do the FST plus a biomarker, then I could randomise people to early and late based on a group that we know will need it. And that's hopefully a study we'll be able to do. So rather than have Sean's you know, area of equipoise, we'll be able to have people that we know I've got a high chance of going on to renal replacement therapy and then doing them early or late, depending. Long answer for a short question. Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, I can't see any. There, there are two questions in the Q&A. Uh, let me read them out for you. 
because you, you may not be able to open it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank Almost you. certainly not. So, Gabor Zilla, he asks you, thank you, Professor Forney, excellent as usual. Can you kindly explain how early CRRT would delay kidney recovery? Yeah, thanks, Gabor. Unbelievably, I can open the Q&A, right? So I'm not, not a complete you know, Luddite. So there are several explanations for this, most of which are theoretical. So there's the hemodynamic upset, which I showed, which is you know the, the what we call hemodialysis-induced um, renal toxicity, and you know where I showed the changes in um, longitudinal strain with dialysis, and in intermittent therapies, that's quite well recognised. I mean, so the effect on um, myocardial performance. Um, going on to an extracorporeal circuit is quite impressive. And in fact, Nick Selby, a buddy of mine who is in Nottingham, has done some MRI studies where patients have been on um, renal replacement therapy. So the machine's outside, the away from the magnet, and they've seen you know, quite marked changes in cardiac performance. Um, the other thing is that if you get drops with hemodynamic um instability, you get drops in blood pressure, then you get changes in perfusion, particularly with the tubules, and that may delay, delay recovery because you get intermittent hits. There is another argument, which is quite an interesting one, which is that as the failing kidney sits in this milieu of biomolecules and inflammatory mediators, that they themselves may trigger renal recovery. Right? And this is something that's called permissive azotemia. And so if you actually clear the blood too much, clean the blood too much, you lose these signal molecules that are telling the kidney to recover and that you don't get the same response. Now, I have to say that's incredibly theoretical, but it's quite an interesting um, concept. And Mink Chowler was one that you know, proposed that. It's not a new theory, but it's the fact that, you know, that... That's why with intermittent therapies, you may see um, a difference in renal recovery. But personally, I think most of it is hemodynamic and dialysate choice. So thanks for that question, Gabor. And then there's a uh, question of from Valco. Is that right? From Rosa, yeah. She, she's one of uh, our um, uh, renal oh, replacement right. therapy <laughs> experts from Budapest. So, so, yeah. So you can read it out, Louis. Yeah, so in, yeah, in light of the timing studies, do you think we need a different approach to staging AKI? Should fluid overload or projective fluid overload play a bigger role in deciding whether to start RRT? So that's another lecture, isn't it? So that's a very good question. So whether that's enough to restage AKI or not, I mean, people have only just got used to the Cadigo guidelines. Put another thing into that would be difficult. But is you know, should fluid overload be considered? Well, I think certainly as a trigger for starting renal replacement therapy, yes. Most of the surveys of practice say that that's the main reason for an intensive care studying starting renal replacement therapy. It's volume overload rather than any of the other classical markers. And certainly in paediatrics, Stu Goldstein's done a lot of work you know, showing that. So I wouldn't say it requires a different approach to staging, but certainly if we're looking at triggers, then it's the most important. Now, there are various AI models where people are trying to develop predictive models of um, patients who will need a renal replacement therapy. The problem there is that, you know, I might start it for one reason, Zolt might start it for another, you know, someone else might start it for another. So you know, we haven't got an absolute defined criteria for that. So would I include it in my criteria for RRT? Definitely. Would I include it in AKI definition? Probably not. What I would do is play more along the role of the um, AKI naught, but biomarker positive. So that's what's called the subclinical AKI. And I think this is really important 
because as you're probably all aware, you need to lose more than 50% of your function before creatinine elevates. Particularly in our septic patients where creatinine production itself may drop by 50%. So if you're using standard markers, you may not realize that your kidneys are really complaining before it's a bit too late. So, you know, biomarker positivity in early intervention may well be um, important in some groups. But that was a great question. I like that. And Dilan, you have a question? Thank you for the lecture. Um, I was wondering, it can be a uh, problem with these uh, uh, research methods that uh, it's only renal replacement therapy in a big population that is uh, checked against the question. But uh, renal replacement therapy that we initiate, if it uh, started uh, with uh, fluid with high flow or low flow, or uh, we are uh, getting out fluid from the patient from the beginning or not, I can imagine that it's affecting uh, the outcomes in a huge, great amount. So it would be interesting to see, um, you know, the response of the patients to the settings of the machine, uh, because that can highlight the differences between early and non-early. Yeah. So the, the right. So you've kind of hit the nail on the head here, and uh, you know, so Zarbot study, Alex's study, the Elaine study shows that really. Because you know, if you have patients with a degree of volume overload, you treat them early, they do better. Right? Not only do they do better in the short term, but that effect was um, prolonged over a year. So it probably reflected their underlying cardiac performance, put them in a position where they weren't doing very well. Um, the whole question about dose and delivery of dose and UF rate, it's really quite difficult because you know, if you look at some of the studies that show a higher UF rate, the patients do less well. Well, that's a chicken and egg argument, right? Because you know, you're probably setting a UF rate that's high to get rid of more fluid because the patients are more fluid overload loaded and sicker. So you want to get control quicker. So you use a higher UF rate. Yeah. So there is that. Could be, of course, that the patient can't tolerate a high flow, and so you know there'll be a different cohort there. So it's difficult to to tease those out. And if you look at the dosing studies, right? Everyone quotes the dosing studies as if they're Bible and gospel. What the dosing study showed is that in relatively stable patients, right? Relatively stable patients, if you compare the low dose or what, 25 mils to 40 mils, there was no benefit, right? So does that mean a higher dose is of no use? No, it doesn't, right? Because when a patient comes in initially, you might want to use a higher dose to get metabolic control, but those patients were never studied, right? So my own view is your dose prescription and your UF prescription is entirely dictated by the patient that you're looking after. So, you know, if a patient comes in with a potassium of nine and a pH of 6.5, and they're literally St. Peter is welking them through the gates, right? You're not going to just say, well, we'll put them on 25 mils a minute and we'll see what happens, right? You'll be turning the machine up. You'll probably be giving some extra bicarb and you'll be you know, cranking the UF rate up to get some fluid off. And you know, that's because you're treating the patient. And those patients aren't in the studies, right? The studies were relatively stable patients. So what you're asking is a great question. And what it means is that we ha don't really have the evidence on how to apply RRT well in the ITU patients on an individual basis. So we know what to do with a whole big group, but not that big a group. As I told you in Star AKI, the patient population that went into the study was just over 10%. We can't say to our patients, well, I'm sorry, you would have been excluded from the study, so we're not going to treat you, right? We have to treat everybody. And so part of it is that we have to act like a doctor, right? And we have to use our clinical skills and then determine the best way to assign the tools that we've got. And, you know, 
me and your professor are getting old, me older than him. And so we sound very old fashioned when we say, you know, we have to examine the patient and treat the patient because that's what we we're trained to do. But to be honest, that bit of medicine hasn't changed. And all the computers in the world are going to change that for now, right? Maybe in two or three generations' time, maybe. But um, yeah, so I think that if you're setting your UF rate, setting your, your dose, think about the studies, but also think about the patient in front of you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. You're good. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I, I have two more, and, and we are a bit running out of time here. But, but um, first of all, you know, it's, it's the same old story that all these studies uh, used mortality as a primary outcome for CRRT, and and I just wonder if if you if you would like to design the next CRRT trial. Uh, what other primary outcome would you choose as as a primary outcome? And closely linked to this, uh, I strongly disagree with the overall inclusion of septic patients because it doesn't exist. Septic patient is not a valid entity. It can be a patient on a little bit of of, of nothing, antibiotics, you know, and massive dose, tons of noradrenaline, 100% uh, FiO2, 20 of PEEP, and, and so on. So, uh, uh, in other words, primary outcome and uh, selecting the patient population. What would be your advice? Yeah. So, yeah, we've had this discussion ourselves as well before, you know. So, interestingly, we've just submitting a paper to JAMA or JAMA Open on potential strategies for new trials in AKI, right? Because we're all sick of mortality being used as the endpoint because we all know, regardless of whether you believe in vitamin C or not, that no studies have showed a significant difference in um, mortality and sepsis in the ITU. Having said that, the mortality is kind of edging down slightly, you know, a bit like ARDS. How do you define it? And you know, even the definitions we use are loose in terms of um, clarity. So you can use things like make 90, major adverse kidney event, events at 90 days. So the number of patients that are still on RRT, for example, or require chronic um, treatment. And I think that you know, there are other things that you can use as soft markers you know, they're deeply flawed, like ventilator days and you know, length in, I, R, in ITU. Maybe length in R, I, ITU until you were deemed fit enough to leave because I've got a unit with about 20% of patients that could go to the ward, but I can't get them to the ward because there isn't, isn't room. Um, so I think part of the thing is patient selection. So we need to select more homogenous groups so biomarkers may help us to that end. And then we won't be comparing apples to oranges. We'll be looking at different types of apples. And then, you know, I think that patient relative, relevant endpoints are really quite important. And so for our latest ADKI meeting, we actually used, uh, had a patient representative there who'd been through the AKI mill. And patients, what they view as a, a big positive, we might not point the trial. So, for example, um, this particular chap had to go back onto dialysis. He thought he was free of dialysis and then had to go back on it like at day five or something. And he was destroyed by that. He said that was one of the worst things that happened to him. And yet we would never think about putting that in a study, having to re-go back onto RRT. So if I was designing a study now, I'd want patient en enrichment using biomarkers to look at um, particular groups. I'd want patient-focused endpoints that the patients say that are important. And I would want, this is going to sound terrible, I never thought I'd say this, but some of it would be health economic outcomes. Because, you know, we have to have a bit of responsibility in terms of, you know, what we're doing. And if one particular approach saves a lot of money, then, you know, that could be used for 
other things hopefully in healthcare rather than beating each other up, which is the kind of world we live in at the moment. That was a bit heavy. Sorry about that, Zoltan. <laughs> yeah. no, that's, that's okay. Any other questions? Well, if not, then... Oh, there's one there. Oh, that young lady got a hand up. Do you remember Fati? I do. The how chart paper, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Hello, Professor. Thank you for your lecture. I I only have a short question um, about kinetic GFR. What do you think of it? Do you think it's a useful thing or just another number that we can see? Kinetic GFR. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting, right? And uh, you know, but one of the problems or one of the things it assumes is your creatinine production rate is constant. And if your creatinine production rate is not constant, then it's very difficult to work out what your kinetic GFR means. So if you have a dog and you obstruct their kidneys with clamps, right, then you can probably work out what kinetic GFR is telling you because there's no confounding factors. If you've got a septic patient who might be a bit malnourished, then it's difficult to know. So what I would say to you is, yeah, kinetic GFR is probably quite cool, but continuous measurements of GFR may well be the way forward. And they're not too far away. And so there's one device that's been studied in chronic patients in the US to some success that we're going to start working on here. And that uses um, a fluorescent dye. So it's a bit like inulin. It's not reabsorbed. It's just all excreted. It's just filtered. And it takes about half an hour to build up um, to maximal concentration following an injection. In the skin, you have a probe that just sits on the skin, measures the fluorescence, and calculates your continuous GFR over time. And that will probably be something that could be used in patients at risk where you can see the GFR change. There are other cool adaptations of it, like, you know, if you manipulate the patient, can you see a change in GFR? There are research questions which we don't know yet, which are still in the hands of the veterinary labs, but, you know, we might be using that in, in the future. What, one of the things something like a continuous GFR monitor can be useful for is actually knowing what dose you're actually delivering to the patient and getting your um, antibiotic concentrations, for example, correct in patients with on RLT. So kinetic GFR, it's good in patients that are unstable, in unstable patients where you're not sure on the baseline. It might give you an indicator, but it's not going to be accurate. Okay. Well, I, I can't see any more questions. So, uh, Louis, thanks very much. I think that uh, discussion was absolutely uh, uh, up to our expectations. This is why we decided to do this uh, SIP of Science webinar series to give a chance to the audience to ask questions to uh, international experts. And uh, our next um, edition, next in the series, will be in two weeks time, and it's Claudio Ronco. So we stick to the CRRT stick and blood, pur <laughs> blood purification. So, Sorry. so, so if anyone wants to email me with questions, I'm quite happy with that. Uh, absolutely. I, I can and all, all I can do is apologize again for the technology. If you ever invite me again, I won't show a video of you singing, but I'll also do it from home where I know my machine works perfectly with Zoom. Yeah, well, let me tell you what, before you go, because I, I may forget that by the time we meet, that in a month's time, we're going to have Robert Roberts here from Australia. Yeah. And, uh, and Rob, I emailed him that, Rob, I know that there is a bit of a time difference because 4 p.m. here is 2 a.m. in Australia. And he said, oh, Jolt, it's not a problem. I will go to my office because the internet is better from there. Right. Well, I'd actually like to listen to that one because I'm a great fan of his work, actually. So that would be 
quite interesting. A lot of the stuff on lactate metabolism is really Absolutely. quite interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is going to be a topic in one month, but next time it's Claudio Ronco. <laughs> and uh, we are still with blood purification. So, so thanks very much, Louis. Thanks, everyone, uh, joining us online. And have a nice evening and see you in two weeks' time. Cheers. Bye-bye. Oh, Bye-bye. Okay.